morning everybody passover this year i believe is going to be very special it's going to be memorable for a lot of reasons which i want to talk about today it's going to be very very memorable and so many of us around the world in fact will be keeping passover under the stay-at-home lockdown <laughs> orders you won't be meeting in a group you won't be having your pastor your minister leading things it's going to be you you and god so i'm philip shields host of Light on the Rock, and I like this to be a chat about this year's Passover and how to make it even extra memorable. Uh, I, and I'm hoping that even if others hear this after 2020, it'll be a good memory of what we all did this year. It's not exactly the same thing, but the very first Passover of Exodus 12, the Israelites were also told to stay indoors. They're told to stay indoors, not, not leave until morning. For the death angel was out there trying to find uh, any houses that didn't have the, uh, you know, some verses say it was Jehovah himself out there. Other verses say that an, an angel uh, checking to see who was and wasn't uh, in a house that was splashed with blood. So when we see the lamb's blood covering the entrance to the doorway into the house, he would pass over that. More on that in just a minute. But where there was no blood covering the household, no splashed blood that could be seen uh, on top of the door entrance, the firstborn male... The firstborn male of that house was executed by God or the death angel. And so if we don't come under the blood, someone who's innocent, dying for you and me, then we have to forfeit our own life, at least the firstborn back then. And we are, remember, we are the first fruits of the body of Christ. We are part of his body. He's the first fruits. We're part of his body. And so, yeah, the Passover has a lot to do with those of you being called today. A lot because we are the firstborn, part of the firstborn. We're part of his body, remember. I don't know if you've thought of that before that way. And so anyway, um, all, of, all of those lambs that were being slaughtered just before the Passover was eaten, all of those lambs back in Exodus 12 pointed to the Lamb of God. Remember when John the Baptist, he said when he saw Yeshua coming, Jesus coming, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, John 1, 29, I believe, who takes away the sins of the world. So that first Passover back in Exodus 12 was very special, but that's why Yeshua was meeting with his disciples. He said, okay, from this moment on, we're not going to be talking so much about the lambs of Exodus 12 because they all pointed to me, Yeshua was saying. They all pointed to me. From now on, you do the bread and the wine and the foot washing and all of that and the Passover in remembrance of me, in remembrance of me. So um, remember me as you eat the, eat the bread. Remember me as you take the cup. Remember me as you wash feet. And so he was the fulfillment of those slain, beautiful, spotlight, uh, spotlight, <laughs> spotless lambs. By the way, if I do say wrong things or whatever, it's hard to be focusing on cameras and lighting and notes and everything else and not get your words mixed up sometimes, especially when I'm not reading every word for word. I'm just not. I noticed I said last time... Uh, 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 it, 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 uterine instead of urinary tract infections, you know. So anyway, I hope you, you guys understand that. Sometimes I might say Peter. And I'm, I know it's Paul. Uh, that, that just happens. Anyway, their lambs had to be spotless, without blemish, to depict that God's lamb was sinless, without spot, without any defect at all. So welcome again to Light on the Rock and our free website. Uh, welcome especially all of you who are Gentiles. Anyone who is not of the lineage of Israel is a Gentile. And yet we're all part of the Israel of God. We are all descendants. We're all part of the family of Abraham, Galatians 3 says. And so um, uh, we're all partakers of the promises given to Abraham. Whether you're from India or Kenya or the Philippines or Mexico or Costa Rica, it doesn't matter. Welcome to Passover. So... Uh, Look at the website also, we'll repost some sermons uh, that I've given before. It's just a really busy, busy time, but there's some good sermons. You can go to, uh, just in your search box, put in Passover, and, and, and there'll be a lot of uh, uh, topics or blood, type in the word blood, um, type in the word uh, crucifixion or something like that, and you'll see sermons pop up. It would also be very helpful if 
as many of you who do like the website we have, if you would like it, you know, make a like posting or make comments, it will really help the word get out there a whole lot more. Uh, a lot more people will see it if you'll take the time to do that. So anyway, will this Passover 2020 be a special for you? It should be. Or will it be the same old, same old? I've been keeping Passovers now for, I don't know now, uh, let me see, uh, almost 50 years. And so uh, 49, 50 years. And the first one that I remember was watching my mom do one, and she had all of us children around her. I must have been six or seven at the time, old enough to remember it. Not a lot of detail about it. It was kind of somber, kind of serious. And here's my mom reading the verses, explaining all about uh, Christ, and the, he was the Lamb of God. And she took a little bit of wine, a little bit of, uh, and, then, and then the bread, the unleavened bread. And we were all in our pajamas, <laughs> as I remember it, around her. That was memorable because that was the first one that I had witnessed. And then I was baptized at 18. And that was my first one that I partook of it all completely as a baptized brother. Uh, a regret I have, though, I was young, I was inexperienced, and we had this big mass of people keeping it in Bricketwood, England. And I remember getting in this line with my tub of water and my towel to go do the foot washing. And I was more concerned, as I recall it, at 18. I was a little worried. How do you do this? How, how long do you splash water over the guy's feet? And I wonder if my feet will smell. And I had questions like that at 18, which I think are disgusting questions now as I look back at it. But that's the way it was. Um, more recently, in the last few years, most of the time, Carol and I just do it ourselves, by ourselves, very intimate. I like that. More on that later. So in this sermon, my point, sometimes we, we do a group here and I lead it and whatever, but in this sermon, my point is to show you how this Passover could be a, a very memorable one. And here's some reasons why. Number one, this year's schedule matches, as far as the days of the week go, matches the schedule the year Christ died. He had his Passover on a Tuesday night of that year, 30 AD, and he did call it Passover. A lot of people say it wasn't a Passover. It was just the Lord's Supper. If you look up the word Passover in a concordance, and you'll find where he says to his disciples in all the gospel accounts, I think at least the synoptic gospels, go and find a place where we can keep the Passover. Go prepare the Passover. When they had prepared the Passover, Jesus said, I've longed to keep this Passover, which he had asked them to prepare. So it was called the Passover, to be honest with you. Let's, let's go through that. But anyway, Tuesday night was when he did that. And back in Exodus 12, before we get into that, remember on the 10th day of the year, of the first month of the year, they were to select a spotless lamb and bring it home. Now, lambs are lovely little animals. I've had lambs, I've had goats, mostly goats when I was growing up. Lambs now are a lot more peaceful than goats. Lambs won't hurt you. They follow you around everywhere you go. Uh, cute as can be. You, you'll, you fall in love with them. Goats now. We used to have kids of goats, and when they'd start to grow their little horns, they'd like to butt at me, and I'd push back and play with them. I, when I was a kid growing up in the Philippines, I played with kids, meaning the children of goats. <laughs> and so, uh, but lambs are so gentle and sweet. And, and by the, and so you kept them the day 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Okay, and so by the time you've gone through the 14th, that's five days. And so the Lamb of God, five is the number of grace. Five is the number of grace. The Lamb of God was slain on the 14th at 3 p.m. And so I hope in the last few days you've been bringing the Lamb of God more intimately into your life. And um, uh, I, I hope so. Five is the number of grace, and, and, and I hope you've been bringing the Lamb of God into your life more and have grown very, very dear and fond of him and uh, closer than ever before. Then, anyway, Tuesday night, this year at least, was, will be the Lord's Supper, the, the bread and the wine, the foot washing, same as the, as the timetable of Jesus' day. And it was during that night, uh, Tuesday night now, early Wednesday morning, when, uh, when he was captured 
and he was facing Pilate at 6 a.m. And uh, so it was all it was a long night for Yeshua, a long, painful, dreadful night. And then uh, Wednesday itself, it would be Passover day this year, and uh, he was crucified. He was nailed down to the cross at 9 a.m., the same time they would take the lamb for the nation and tie it down on the altar and leave it there until 3 p.m. when they would kill it. And that's exactly when Yeshua was killed. He fulfilled. I have a sermon, in fact, you might want to look it up, how Jesus fulfilled the Passover in intricate detail, far more detail than, I'm, than I've just given you. But when he was being nailed to the cross, the lamb for the nation was being tied on the altar. And then when they finally, when, when, when they finally slit its throat at 3 p.m., and, and the high priest was saying, it is finished, the, the lamb for the nation. That was that very moment when he said, finished, and he died. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then they buried him because the high day Sabbath, it was a high day Sabbath, an uh, annual Sabbath, the first day of unleavened bread, would begin then Wednesday night, Wednesday night. And all day Thursday is the first day of unleavened bread is a holy day. It was a, an annual Sabbath, what the Jews called the high day. And that's referred to in the book of John, for that Sabbath was a high day. And so they wanted to get Jesus' body in the grave, in the tomb, before sundown, which would be this week, in the same week as, as he did it, Wednesday, late afternoon. So then he's in the tomb, Wednesday night, to Thursday night, to Friday night, to Saturday night. That's your three days and three nights. And he was put in just before sundown on Wednesday. And so just before sundown, Sabbath night, he would have been resurrected because by the time Mary Magdalene, the other women, went to go check the tomb, it was already opened and the body was already gone. He was risen. Now, unfortunately, this year, Wave Sheaf Day, the day of his rising, is exactly correct with Easter this year. It just is. Ishtar, you know, but it is what it is. But you know what? No coronavirus. No plague. No problem. Not even death itself kept Jesus, Yeshua, from being resurrected, which will be this coming Sunday, April 12th, which will be the first of the weeks. It'll be the first day counting towards the, the, the Pentecost. It'll be a wave sheaf offering when he ascended up to heaven. I have a sermon coming up. I'll post it again about the wave sheaf when he ascended to heaven and was accepted on behalf of the rest of the harvest on all of us. Isn't that awesome? Praise you. Praise you. Wave sheaf offering. Anyway, um, I'll give a sermon on that too. My mustache is itching me like crazy right now, so forgive me for that. Anyway, I'm saying the calendar year 2020 is very special because it's a replica of the year that Christ did all this with us for us. Okay, so our king was killed at 3 a.m. Uh, 3 p.m. 3 p.m. What would be this Wednesday? Entombed before sundown Wednesday, late afternoon. Rose up three days and three nights later, exactly as he said, not parts of days, three days and three nights. And by Sunday morning or the first of the week, the tomb was empty. Our Lord had risen. So anyway, it's very special, number one, because it matches this year's special, because it matches the year and the sequence of events when Yeshua died. Now, number two, in that first Passover, in a sense, for a limited time at least, the Israelites were in lockdown. Get indoors. Don't come out of your house till morning. Okay? They were on lockdown. The coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic going on. It's kind of like the death angel out there. You know, I just thought of saying it that way now. I don't really mean literally, but we're all in lockdown. We're all told to stay home unless it's a real emergency. But I think the fact there's a dangerous virus from China going around the whole world killing many thousands, and it was from China. Don't apologize for that. 
They've had too many of these epidemics coming out of those wet markets in China that I spoke about in my last sermon about God's amazing health laws. And many, many thousands more are dying around the world. Uh, no doubt before it's all done, many more will die. I don't personally feel that if we're praying for God's mercy, like I asked you to, to be praying for the world, if you are doing that and I'm doing that, I personally don't believe we're going to see anywhere near the numbers that we're being told. We were told a few weeks ago that if all of us did everything possible, all of us stayed home, we'd still have 100 to 100,000 to, I think they said 240 or 220,000. Will still absolutely that many will die. No, it's not going to happen because there are God's people praying fervently for God's mercy. We are not going to see 100,000, 240,000 killed. I believe that very, very strongly. And that's, they said, if we absolutely did it all perfectly, but it's not what we do perfectly. We have our part, sure. The main part we have is to pray for God to be merciful and put a, put a uh, protection and kill the virus in this nation. As I speak, we're close to 10,000, I believe, uh, killed. I really will be surprised if it goes much above 30,000. Maybe 30, 40, 50,000. I'll be very surprised if it goes over 30,000 much. Because God is merciful. But we have this pandemic going on. It's scaring everybody, just like that death angel out there going on was scaring everybody. And, but I believe that this pandemic, by the way, is really God trying to get our attention, not just us in America, but all over the world. I don't care where you are around the world, you know about this. He wants your attention. He wants you seeking him. He wants you putting down your idols. He wants you obeying his laws. He wants you praying to him. Look what God did. He says, you want to idolize sports people and the heroes? All right, I'm going to close down all the stadiums. All right, you want to idolize the, the movie stars? I'm going to close down the theaters. You want to idolize the performers? I'm going to close down the civic centers. You want to idolize the government? I'll even close down government buildings. Who do you want to idolize? You want to idolize the stock market and your great wealth? Well, I'll shut that down and make it crash. I hope we're waking up. And during this Tenth plague going out in ancient Israel. I believe, we can't prove who wrote Psalm 91, but many believe that probably it was Moses. And um, the author is unknown, but let's read Psalm 91 because it is very apropos, and we do believe it was written by Moses, right as the wailing and the screaming could be heard as people discovered that their firstborn son or husband or brother, firstborn dogs and animals and horses, we're all dead. I believe Moses wrote this. I can't prove that, but let's read it. Psalm 91, and I hope you'll read this in your times, your fear. Play. What I'm saying about the, uh, the pandemic, by the way, is I believe this is the first one. I believe it's the first of many, many waves to come in the next five, six, eight, ten years. I really do. I believe that. We'll see. Each one will be progressively worse if we don't learn our lessons. If we don't come in repentance before Almighty God, there will be many, many more of these. We can't keep bailing people out to the tune of trillions. We don't have that kind of money. We're printing money that we don't really have. There will be many more. There will be worse ones than this one. Let's learn our lessons. Psalm 91, verses 1 to 11. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of Jehovah, the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. I'm not going to trust in the stock market. I'm not going to trust in going back to work. I'm not going to trust in the government. I'm not going to trust on everybody else doing their part. I'm going to, we all do our part, sure. But our faith and our trust has to be in Jehovah, Most High, above. Verse 3, he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence. The arrow that flies by day, we might talk about missiles today. Nor of the pestilence that walks in the darkness. You know, these little tiny microscopic viruses... 
Now the saying, it's gone viral, means something. <laughs> it spreads like crazy. Uh, nor of the pestilence that walks in the darkness, verse 6 I'm reading, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. That's battle. And that's, that's not just battle, but also the plagues and all that. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand. It shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look and, and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made Yehovah. Because, verse 9, because, because you have made Yehovah, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you. If you and I do this and really make him our refuge, or if we get it, it won't have an effect on us. Just like snakes sometimes would bite Paul and he just shook him off in the fire. Deadly snakes had no effect on him. For he shall give his angels, verse 11, charge over you to keep you in all your ways. So in this coronavirus, be turning to John 14, we're going to obey God's laws, the, land, the laws of the land as well. And we're going to stay home except to go out for emergencies. Sure, we're going to do that. And our faith this Passover is completely in God Almighty. We're under lockdown. We're not afraid because we're with him and he's with us. In John 14, verses 19 to 23, a little while longer, Yeshua says to his disciples, this is just before Passover, the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. And in that day you will know that I am in my Father. If you haven't heard my series on being in God, type in the search bar, in God, in Christ. And uh, how we must be in Him and He must be in us. What does it mean to be in Him? I think we understand how He's in us by the Holy Spirit. But how, what does it mean for us to be in Him? Because I live, you will live also. I am in my Father, verse 20. And you in me, and I in you. He says, you're in me, I'm in my Father. And that's how we get to be in the Father, because we're in Christ. Colossians 3.3. 3. Go back and make a note of that, Colossians 3.3. 3, that we're in the Father because we're in Christ, who is in the Father. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Verse 21. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. And Judah says, how will blah, 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 questions. In verse 23, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, I say that because of time. Uh, I have to rush here. He will keep my word. If you love Christ, keep his word. Obey him. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him, we, my Father and I, Yeshua speaking, and make our home with him. We're going to come live inside of you by God's Holy Spirit. We're going to be right there partaking with you. So while we're in lockdown, stay home. Invite God into your home, your body, your life, your soul, your thoughts, your mind. Feel his presence. Reach out to him. Invite him in. Open the door. Don't be like the Laodiceans who have to have Christ outside the door, knocking on their door. Let me in. Let me in. No, no. Open the door wide. Invite him in. Say the words to him. Please come and live inside of me. Change me. You live. You live and don't let me live. You live. You become my life. So Israel had to stay indoors for a time too, didn't they? Now, just like we do. And, but the Almighty, our very own Daddy, who happens to be Almighty God Most High, our Abba, our Daddy, is here with us. And he is Almighty God Most High. Our, the one we're going to marry, Yeshua, this, our Savior. He's going to be here with us. In our thoughts, in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives. Number three. So number one, same schedule. Number two, we're under lockdown, just like ancient Israel was kind of confined to their home. So are we, but we're in our homes, but God's with us. Number three, you can keep Passover this year as a very intimate one this time. In other years, you got dressed and you went out. You got in the car, you went out, and you met with a whole bunch of other people, and you had Passover, and you washed feet, and there was a minister there, and, you know, it's kind of distracting having so many people and maybe a little noise over here or there. 
this Passover, let it be different. This Passover, if it's just you by yourself or one or two or three others, that's probably all it's going to be for a lot of us. It's just my wife and me that here this Passover. I'm looking forward to it. I would recommend you guys don't even go online. Do your own Passover like they used to do back in Israel. Each one had a household. They had their own Passover. They didn't have a priest. They didn't even have priests yet in Exodus 12. They had their own little Passover, their own little prayers. So I urge you all to speak Passover yourself. Pray Passover yourself. Even if you're a woman, don't feel that you can't. Please do. I say that way because usually we tend to look at men as the leaders in church. But I urge you to not even do the online service. Not even mine. I'm going to try to post one for those who absolutely feel they need to have an online service or need to, uh, to watch and hear or see me or somebody else doing it. I'll try to get one ready. But even if I myself put one up, I am urging you, maybe print my notes if you want to have something to read from and go by, but you do it. Your voice, your heart, you and God, you and God. Make it intimate. Make this Yeshua's time with you. No distraction. If you're by yourself, the even more intimate you can be. When you read about the bread and the wine and pray, Make this a time when it's you and God, you and God, just you yourselves. If you have two or three or four, that's fine. Keep it intimate. So, for example, in the foot washing, when you come up and do the foot washing, and then the bread and the wine and all that, let's talk about the, as you do your service. In John 13, uh, verses 2 to 8, supper being ended, or as it was ending, because he obviously was still eating and dipping things into the to indicate who would be the, the one who would betray him. But as supper was ending, the disciple having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him, Yeshua, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, this is the context that he was thinking about when he got up to wash feet, and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Notice what he was thinking about. Even though I am God, I'm the Word of God, with God, and, all, and am God, with God, as John 1 says. Rose from supper, laid aside his garments, his outer garments. He took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel with which he was girded. Came Simon Peter. Simon was never at a loss for words. What are you doing? Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus said, what I'm doing, you don't understand right now, Peter, but understand this. And Peter says, uh, you're not going to wash my feet. Verse 7, verse 8. And Jesus said, Peter, listen, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Yes, he was teaching, of course, that we must not be lording it over others. Yes, he was teaching humility and service service and serving one another yes of course but sometimes a very overlooked part of the foot washing is right there in verse 8. to me that's the biggest part he was saying for you to eat of my bread and drink of my cup for you to be part of my body i have to wash you first if i don't wash you you have no part with me or of me we cannot be a part of the body of Christ and remain unwashed. We were baptized, given God's Spirit, and baptized by God's Spirit into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 says that. And since then, we have had sins, we've had failures and stumbles. We've walked in this dusty life we have of, you know, we have wrong thoughts, we have, we have worries, we have faith, we have temptations, we have sins, maybe drank too much, had a sex sin or something. Whatever it was, the wrong thoughts, they have to be washed away. So our Savior must clean us. There's more, though. John 13, verse 12 to 17. Should we continue to wash feet, or was that a one-off? 
John 13, verses 12 to 17. So when he'd washed their feet, notice he'd washed them all. By the way, Judas Iscariot was there still. Yeshua washed Judas's feet. If you could go back in time, or if he could be brought back in time before he died, and suddenly appears in your foot washing, and he identifies himself as Judas Iscariot, would you wash his feet? Messiah did. Anyway, he says to them, John 13, 12, you know what I've done to you. You call me teacher and Lord, and, and, and you say, well, because that's what I am. Verse 14, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you, all, you also ought to wash one another's feet. You need to keep doing this. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. His real point, of course, is serve each other, be humble to each other, and know that I've washed the parts of my body that are part of my body. I want you to wash them also. Notice he'd already washed all their feet. And he's saying, I want you to wash feet too. From the point of view that you might know of someone's sin or you might not think well of somebody, I've watched that person. This is the part we don't talk about enough in, in Passover services about foot washing. It's not just service. It's not just humility. It's about seeing each other as washed by Christ. <laughs> and as we wash that person's feet ourselves, we're acknowledging to that person, I see you as washed. I accept you as a brother or sister. I see you as cleansed by the Messiah. I hold nothing against you. So he's already washed their feet, and that's the point. Church members have been washed by Christ already. I have been, you have been. We, we're just acknowledging that we believe it, we accept it, and we accept that brother or sister washed by the Messiah as our own brother or sister. I want you this year, as you do foot washing, to focus on the word washing and not just on service and humility. Yes, focus on those two, but focus on washing. Washed by the blood and by the water of Yeshua himself, and so are you, so so you're just acknowledging that. So we're the body of Christ. I think the the biggest lesson is accept your brother. He's been accepted by Christ, and see each person in the body is already washed. And we're warned in First Corinthians 11. You got to stop all this infighting. You're, you're not discerning the body of Christ. First Corinthians 11, towards the end of it, and you're guilty of the body and the of the blood of Christ, uh, and that's why a lot of you aren't being healed. He says, so. What I say when I'm washing feet, many times if I'm washing someone else's feet, I'll look up and I'll say, let's just use a name, Mark or Jason, Clyde, could be any name. And I look up at him as I kneel before him, and I say, I see you washed in the blood, and I see you washed by Yeshua. And by me washing your feet, I'm just telling you, I acknowledge to you I accept you as a brother washed by our Savior. And then I wash his feet. Once we see each other as washed and ourselves have to be seen as washed, now we can go on with life. The condemnation has stopped. Uh, we were baptized, but now all, anything we picked up since then is washed away. Now we're ready to take the bread and the wine. You can't take the bread and the wine in my view at least, unless you renew the washing first. Now the bread is Christ's body. He was born in Beth Bethlehem, Bethlehem, which means house of bread. Isn't that something? House of bread. And he says, I'm the bread of life. I'm the manna from heaven. And when you, if you have matzah that you use, I don't have any matzah because we're under lockdown, right? So we didn't go out and buy any. We just made our own unleavened bread. But if you have a sheet of matzah, hold it up to the light, and you'll see stripes across it. Across it. By stripes we're healed, right? And you'll see holes in there. He was pierced for our sins. 
He was pierced for us. And those who pierced him shall see him. He was pierced. So I like the matzah because it has the stripes and it has the little piercing holes. I'll go into more detail of that in the Passover service for time's sake. I gotta keep moving here. And then we take and then we ask the blessing on the the bread and we, we break it at that point and eat it. And then we ask the blessing on the wine. It should be red wine. And we uh, we 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 drink the one the amount that's been poured out ahead of time. You don't have to throw away the whole bottle, but just pour out little vials ahead of time, put the other bottle of the remainder away. And so in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25, in the same manner he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup, 1 Corinthians 11, 25, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. He's starting the new covenant at that Passover. This is the new covenant in my blood. You see, it's not a restored, renewed covenant. It's a brand new one. If you haven't heard my sermon on why the new covenant blows away the old covenant, it is so much better. Please do hear it. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So the focus was not on the blood of the lamb splashed on the side of the doors. By the way, the splashed on the side of the doors, that would represent his hands out here. And splashed at the top would represent where his bloodied head would be up against the post of the stake. <coughs> So, but we don't focus on that so much as we focus on him himself. Now, Matthew 20, um, and the other thing I want to focus on here is not just the wine. You'll see that Yeshua himself says, and, and Paul just, we just read it, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-five. 25, we can post that back up there again. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-five. 25, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This cup, and he took the cup. Then say he took the wine after supper. He took the cup. Of course, inside the cup was wine. I understand that. But drinking of, of the cup, do you remember the story when, I think her name was Salome, the mother of, uh, or Salome, however you say it, uh, the mother of uh, James and John. I think that, that was her, uh, her name. Might, might, I might be wrong on that one. There's another Salome as well, so I don't want to get that mixed up. But anyway, in Matthew 20, verses 21 to 23, she said, she came up to Yeshua, let's put, put, put it on the board as I speak it. And she says, um, and he says, what do you want? He says, just grant that my sons, one sit on your left, one sit on your right when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus, verse 22, Matthew 20, verse 22 says, you don't know what you're asking for. He says, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm about to be baptized with? And they said to him, yes, we are. So he said it to them, are you able to take that cup and drink of that cup? He said, indeed, you'll drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right or left, that's up to my father to decide that. He's saying right here that when you drink of a cup of Christ, you're saying whatever you have in store for me, the blessing, the wonderful time, and the valley of shadow of death times, the painful times, I'm going to accept the cup that you make me have in my life. I'm not going to expect it's all going to be wine and roses the rest of my life. It's not going to be all pleasurable time in all the rest of my life. Drinking of that cup was the same thing that a man did when he was proposing to a woman. He'd pour water into a cup or glass and he would say, I would like you to be part of my life going forward. And if you drink of this cup, you're saying, yes, I accept your offer to marry me. I am willing to go through, for better or for worse, whatever life has in store for us together. And they would both drink of that cup. So when Yeshua says, this is the new covenant in my blood, he was basically proposing to them, and here were these big burly guys probably wondering, what, what's he doing proposing to us? Because it was very similar, not identical, but similar to the wording that a man would say to his hopeful uh, fiancé. And remember also, and if we put up here Mark 14, verses 32 to 36, in the Garden of the Oil Press, Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane means oil press, where all the, where all the olives were put in this big round uh, stone container, and another big stone was put on top of it, and that would be rolled around and around. 
and all the juices and all the oil from those, uh, from those um, olives would be crushed out. Yeshua was like an olive being crushed and he sweated blood. He talked about his cup. Mark 14, 32 to 36. They came to the place called Gethsemane, the Garden of the Olive Crush. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And, he, and then he took Peter, James, and John with him. He began to be troubled, deeply distressed. Somebody asked, can I pray when I'm deeply distressed? Distressed, yes. That's what Yeshua did. He said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. I feel like I'm going to die. Because he had seen, no doubt, many, many crucifixions. Who would want to go through that? You know good and well, you wouldn't want to. He knew the pain they would put people through. They had a way of keeping people alive as long as possible, it's in as much pain as possible. He went a little f further, fell on the ground, prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he says, Abba, Daddy. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. That's what the cup means. That's what drinking that cup of red wine means. You're willing to take whatever God has in store for you. Might mean the death of a child. Might mean the death of your spouse. Might mean your death. Might mean severe pain. Might mean the loss of jobs. It might mean persecution. And it might mean wonderful times too. So that's what it means. It means accepting whatever your husband and our God has in store for you. Going through the life, married or, or affianced to him. Being the cupbearer, remember, was a very dangerous job because they were always trying to poison the king. So the cupbearer would pour the wine out into a cup. He would drink it first. Okay, it's safe. I didn't die. Go ahead. You see, so whatever's in that cup. So rabbis always said it had to be red wine. And there's no wine that you can get from grapes until the grapes are crushed. Not just the olives, but the grapes have to be crushed. Yeshua was crushed, beaten, no doubt stomped and hit and spit on, crucified through his wrists. When it says the hands, look at my hands. The hands in, 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 in those days would go all the way, all the way up to here, the, uh, up to the wrist. If you put a, a, a nail through a hand, there, uh, there's not enough there to support the weight. But through the wrist, there is enough there to support the, the weight. And so that's what they would do. They put it right through his wrist and through his heels, his ankles and heels. You ask anyone with severe plantar fasciitis how painful it can be when the nerves, at the bottom of your feet, or someone going through neuropathies and the heat and the pain By his stripes were healed. By, you can ask him to take the pain upon himself when we're praying for healing. So the red wine pictures the priceless blood of our wonderful Savior. The Israelites had to splash the blood from their lamb, had to be on their homes, and the lamb had been in their homes for five days, and they splash it on the doorposts and on the top. And then the death angel will go around, Exodus 12, verse 13. God says, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood of those innocent, beautiful lambs, I will pass over you. I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. 
We're going to be indoors. We're going to be under the blood. We're going to be drinking of his cup. The plague will not come near you. Sorry, but it's very meaningful to me. The plague will not come near you. We're ready for Passover. Make sure you're not just putting physical leaven out. Ask God to purge your whole body, your soul, your heart and your mind. Make a commitment. The weaknesses and sins you've had as a wife, as a husband, as a son, as a father, as a male, as a female, as a person, are being purged. As you do the foot washing, as you do the bread and the wine, you are one with Christ. I would ask you to vocalize it. I would ask you to, like it says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Father in heaven, you say in your prayer, I believe in the Son of God. I believe in your Son. I believe he died for me. For me. For you. And I believe you raised him from the dead. And I believe he's there in power, waiting for you to send him back. Thy kingdom come. Send him back, O Lord, and be merciful to your people and to the land. And help each of us turn. Turn from our wicked ways and heal our land. 1 John 1, verses 7 to 10. If you walk in the light, as he's in the, in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. I've got some pretty horrible sins in my past, but aren't, they're not there now. So I really don't. They're not just buried. They're not just put away. They're washed away. They're gone. There's some people I talk to who have a hard time forgiving themselves. I wrestled with that. Sometimes still fall into that. God says, I forgot these. I've washed them away. If we say we have no sin, that's the other side. People think they're perfect. You deceive yourself. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. All. No exceptions. So forgive yourself and forgive people you don't like. And whoever you don't forgive as we come to Passover, it's not in my notes, I've been inspired to tell you now, if you're holding anything against anybody, might be a daughter, might be a mother, a son, or father, might be a neighbor, someone you work with, someone at church, an ex-husband, an ex-wife, if you're holding anything against anybody, present husband or wife, stop it. Forgive them, or you won't be forgiven. The blood's still on you. You want all your sins forgiven. Forgive us this day. I mean, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, our sin debts, as we forgive those who've sinned against us, as we forgive those debtors who have sinned against us. It goes on to the end of the Lord's Prayer to say, For if you don't forgive someone who sinned against you, you will not be forgiven. So come to the Passover knowing you have forgiven, not just forgiven everybody, asking, but asking God's blessing. Asking God's blessing on those you once hated. There's coming a great tribulation. There's some who are going to be called out of the great tribulation. A great number of people are going to be called out of it. In Revelation 7, 13 and 14, John is asked, do you know who these people are? He says, no, I'm sure you do know. But now in, in Revelation 7, 14, he said, These are the ones, the angel said, who have come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Here again, a washing, a way of sin. 
So the blood of Christ brings us near to God. It takes the wrath that was on us and puts it on Christ. That's why he was beaten so hard. That's why he had to die such a horrible death. Because he was representing the justice of God. That all of the wrath for the sins that I've committed, you've committed, the whole world's committed, were put on that poor 33-year-old, barely over 30s, man, who'd done no wrong. That blood of Jesus also buys us back so now we can belong to God. 1 Peter 1 Verses 18 to 19, knowing you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood, you were redeemed, you were bought back, you now belong to God. He belongs to you. We belong to each other with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. You were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. So by the grace of God and the sacrifice of his dear son, you've been saved from what would have been your destiny. I don't want to use the word fate. That's a god or goddess, whatever it was. The fates, you know, all so much. So, so many words in our English language. It's going to have to be cleaned up. We can't say echo. We can't say serial. We can't say fate. Uh, you, you know, so many words we can't use. We can't harp on something, and a harpy and all this. Oh, man. I'll finish with that. I urge you all to read the last few chapters of Matthew and Mark and John, John 13, uh, 19 or 20, and be soaking your mind with Passover topics during this week. Really appreciate our God. So why is this going to be such a great Passover? Because it matches the year that Jesus died, number one. Number two, because we're in lockdown. Just like those Israelites were. They were in lockdown. Couldn't leave till morning. And we're being protected from the plague. Just like they were in Psalm 91. And we get to have a very intimate service. I hope you guys will take me up on that. Just maybe grab some notes, make some notes, or use my notes that I'll be putting posting up. I, I, I'm sure you'll find posted something up there about uh, Passover service from years back. I'll, I'll try to make a new one. Otherwise, we'll just have to post uh, one from years before. But um, make it a very intimate one. And then remember that the blood of the Lamb and the love of our Father, as we come back to them reconciled, we can have a very intimate one as we wash feet, as we, re, re, as we tell the brother or sister, I see you as washed. And I hope you see me as washed. I hope you all see me as washed. I had a lot to be washed of. So do you. <laughs> So do you. We've all sinned. Praise you, Allah. Praise you, Yeshua. Let's bow your heads, please. Abba, our holy, holy, holy God. Who hates sin and loves righteousness. That's what you are. Righteous Father, you are our Father. And Yeshua, the Word of God, the Son of God, they're beside you. We come to you also. We thank you. We thank you for this season. We thank you for this Passover season. We thank you for your incredible love that you sent and you allowed and you had to watch your only one, your only son going through what he went through and you could not, did not stop it. He had to be offered for the rest of us because you loved all of us so much that you made him be the one upon whom all the sins were placed. Yeshua, you did no wrong and yet you stood up and said, I'll do it. Your love for us is Incalculable. Incalculable. Father and Son, both of you, thank you. Thank you for who you are and how you went through all that. Yeshua without sin is beyond me. We praise your holy name. Help us come to Passover 
ready and take it in a worthy manner. We praise you, Abba. We praise you, Yeshua. Yeshua's mighty name. Well done, Master. Well done. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.